Καλησπέρα και καλώς ήρθατε στην τρίτη ημέρα της λέσχης εκφραστικής ανάγνωσης εν μέσω κορονοϊού 2020. Ε, σήμερα θα κάνω εξάσκηση στα αγγλικά μου. Ε, θα διαβάσω την πρώτη ραψοδία από το επικό ποίημα La Liberazione, La Jerusalem Liberata, συγγνώμη, άλλη Liberazione, ε, του Τορκουάτο Τάσο. Καθότι τα Ιταλικά μου δεν είναι σε καλή κατάσταση, θα διαβάσω την πιο πρόσφατη αγγλική μετάφραση που έχω στα χέρια μου, η οποία νομίζω ότι είναι και πολύ ε, καλή. Ε, και ελπίζω να ε, σας αρέσει. <clears throat> I sing of war, of holy war, and him, captain who freed the sepulchre of Christ. Greatly he wrought by force of mind and limb, and greatly suffered, nobly sacrificed. Vainly did hell oppose him, Asia grim, vainly combined with Libya, hell enticed. Heaven favoured him and guided back to fight under his sacred flag each errant knight. O muse, not you who upon Helicon garland your brow with long since faded bays, but you who among heavenly choirs don your golden crown of deathless stars always, breathe in my breast celestial fire, shed on my, shed on my song your light, and pardon if my lays, Embroidering the truth seem overgrown at times with pleasures other than your own. You know how, where Parnassus most prefers its flattering sweets, the world flocks in delight, yet how, by charming in mellifluous verse, truth has disposed the most depraved to write, as sometimes to a feverish child the nurse holds out a glass with sugar drim. Her slate tricks him to drain the bitter drought, so stealth restores him, and delusion gives him health. And you, magnanimous Alfonso, who snatch me from fortune's rage, who guide to port me, errant pilgrim, battered to and fro by waves and rocks that made my spoil their sport, accept these sheaves with gracious eye. Of you and yours these votive offerings report. Perhaps one day my prescient pen will try boldly to write what now mere hints imply. It well accords with reason that, if at peace Christ's holy folk should find itself some day, ready to make the fierce Thracian release by force of ships and steeds, his unjust prey, earth's sceptre should be yours, or, if you please, yours on the seas the undisputed sway. Meanwhile, be you as Godfrey was of yore. Attend to my song, and gird yourself for war. Five years had passed since on their eastward course the Christian warriors launched their lofty quest. Nicaea was already theirs, by force, great Antioch too, by stratagem possessed. This they defended in protracted wars with Persia's countless host, even as they pressed onward and conquered Tartus next. But here harsh winter made them to bide the coming year. The winter rains were ceasing their control of the army's power to resume the war, when from his lofty throne, beneath which roll unblemished spheres of holy bliss, as far as from hell's centre to the utmost pole, so far is heaven beyond the highest star, the Eternal Father downward casts his eyes, and in one flash sees all the earth and skies. All things he saw, then cast, in the demesne of Syria upon Christian leaders that exact, gaze of his which will pierce the souls of men to their inmost wills. There he saw Godfrey, racked with a pure need to oust the Saracen from Salem's hallowed ground, a man compact of faith and zeal, to whom the joys of earth, the fame, the sway, the spoils, were nothing worth. But in Baldwin next he sees a grasping soul, intent on grandeurs of the human kind, sees Tancred hold life cheap in the control of a hopeless love, the torment of his mind, 
and sees how Bohemond makes it his goal to refound Antioch to him assigned and in his new reign to establish law, good customs, arts and true religions all. A task to which so ardently he turns he can, it seems, remember nothing else. Rinaldo's warlike spirit he discerns, scorning repose, him neither gold impels nor empire, it is fame alone that burns and the boundless will with which his bosom swells. He sees him hang upon the lips of Guelph, and in his forebears glory seek himself. After the world's king had with piercing view laid bare the hearts of these and others, he called from his shining angel retinue Gabriel, second of the first degree, who between God and his elected few is blithe interpreter and herald free, who brings heaven's tidings earthward and repairs skyward, bearing the zeal of mortal prayers. Said God unto his messenger, Go find Godfrey, and ask him in my name. What need for more delay? Why is the fight declined by which enslaved Jerusalem shall be freed? Let him call his chiefs to counsel and remind the truants of their task. For he shall lead, I elect him here. On earth, through their election, they, once his peers, shall fight by his direction. He spoke and eagerly did Gabriel speed to perform his bidding, and in air rendered his viewless spirit palpable with mortal limbs and shape, of an age somewhere between boyhood and youth. Such human shell, but charged with awe and splendour everywhere, he made his own and fixed upon his maze of golden curls and nimbus of white rays. White wings he donned with tips of gold, whose climb is indefatigably swift and sure, with which through winds and clouds he soared sublime above round earth's and ocean's curvature. So garbed, down from eternity to time, from purest regions to a world impure, he swept, and first upon Mount Lebanon paused, balanced on extended wings. Then on, toward Tortosa's coast, he veered in flight, precipitously down upon his embassy. Just then the sun was rising into sight, the face of dawn still half hid in the sea, while, offering up his customary rite, Godfrey was praying to the deity, when, by a second sun, the light increased, and the angel rose before him from the east, saying to him, Godfrey, behold the day of battle is at hand, the seasons mend. Why then this interval? Wherefore delay to free captive Jerusalem? Go send for all your chiefs in council, and invay the laggards to remember the great end. You hereby God ordains their leader, and freely they shall submit when you command. God sends me as his envoy to reveal his purpose to you in his name. And oh, how firm your hope must be, how hot your zeal entrusted with this force to crush his foe. He seizes and is gone. Pure spheres conceal his form on high. Godfrey remains below. That blaze, those words, made his whole being start, his eyes in splendour lost in all his heart. But once recovered and reflecting who had come, who sent, what sense the words contained, he, if at first before, how burned to do and finish the great feat for him ordained. No pride to be the first among the few so chosen puffed thoughts he entertained. Rather, by God's will his own will became one with God's fire, a spark within a flame. Then his heroic peers, dispersed nearby, he summons to assembly. Letter follows letter, and envoy, envoy. Humble prayers fly, joined with high reasons, all designed to wet or inflame the generous spirit, or to cry where goodness lay asleep. Awake! Grow better! Each word hits home, each phrase in his employ compels and makes compulsion seem a joy. The leaders came, the others followed soon, and only Bohemond remained away. Some camped outside, to some Tortosa town opened its walled lodgings for their stay. The army's great ones gathered to commune a glorious senate on the solemn day. 
To then great Godfrey thus began to preach, fate on his face and thunder in his speech. Warriors of God, whom heaven's king did decree, healers of scars, his faith has suffered here, whom safely he did lead on land and sea, through blood and treachery, year after year, and fewer years than looked for, so that we made every rebel province yield in fear, and, having conquered them and made them tame, spread his victorious banners and his name. Our dear ones and our nests were left behind, not, if this be no error, I assert, to risk the treacherous oceans, or to find in distant wars occasion to be heard for some brief plaudits of a vulgar kind, or the possession of barbarian dirt, paltry the prize, and mean would be our goals, to spill our blood at peril of our souls. No, one far beacon guided all our minds, to storm Mount Zion's noble walls, to cure the scandal of the shameful yoke which binds Christians in slavery so vile and poor, to refound Palestine, so that worship finds religion's throne renewed there and secure, and none forbids when pious pilgrims bow at the great sepulchre to keep their vow. Well then, what we achieved was great in risk, greater in cost, if less in fame, and nothing to our purposes, if yet our force fail, or strike where we never came to strike. What use if we raise such a threat of Europe's might and set Asia aflame, if our grand movement failed us after all, and, rather than raise kingdoms, made them fall? Foolish is he who builds his empire where the sole foundation is of worldly clay, to whom some few of foreign habits swear allegiance, at whom hordes of pagans bay, who trusts the Greeks, of whom we should beware, with aid from the West a thousand leagues away. A man like that builds only to his doom. The walls he shakes down will become his tomb. Turks, Persians, Antioch, a famous list of feats as glorious as the names are brave, yet not our doing. If God did not assist our strength, though strong we were, and save the palm for us, his gift. To balk or twist the goal the giver aimed at when he gave will make him take it back, I fear, till we strut as an idle tale through history. Let none be vile enough, God grant, to lose or squander grace like his for tawdry gains. Let those to whom the thread is offered choose to weave what glory fame holds in her skeins. Now that a clear path shines for us to use, now that the season smiles on us, what chains hold us from hastening to that city's door, our destiny? What are we waiting for? Princes, I swear to you, and what I swear the world will hear, and what I hear adjure the future, ye, the saints in heaven, will hear. Now is the time when all our plans mature. To bide a chance will make it disappear, make most uncertain what is now most sure. If we delay, this prophecy is mine. Egypt will come in aid of Palestine. He spoke, and a brief murmur went about, until the hermit Peter rose to view, who first preached the crusade and led it out, whose private voice princes and council knew. I second Godfrey, there can be no doubt, incontrovertibly, as he thought through, truth is a thing impossible to miss, therefore embrace it. I add only this. Unless I'm blind, the quarrels and the blame that each of you puts in the other's way, much like competitors in a foolish game, contrarious plans, slow seeds, mad disarray, don't cause themselves. Rather, this is my claim, the cause of your disorder and delay is, rule hangs in a scale suspended still by many thoughts without a common will. Where one sole man does not control the law, in whom rewards and sanctions find their source, from whom all duties and all powers draw their being, government will veer off course. Ah, let one body knit your limbs in awe, make one sole head lend them its light and force. To one sole man sceptre and power bring, grant him the place and image of a king. Here the old man grew still. O light, O fire divine, what mind, what breast is close to you? 
You now the hermit's holy words inspire, etched in the heart of all the chivalrous crew, rays all ingrained, no, all innate desire that covets privilege or honours due. William and Guelph, those two of royal seed, the first were first to cry, Let Godfrey lead! The rest concurred. Above all others, he must be the one to choose and to command, to frame laws for the vanquished, to decree whom to oppose and to when in battle, and to use his erstwhile peers, even as he saw fit, as tools for his imperial hand. Bearing the tale of what they thus decide, fame, sped by human tongues, flew far and wide. Displayed before his men he stands, and they in him find high command meetly disposed. Nodding to their salute and the display of martial pomp, face quiet and composed, pleased by the modest and affectionate way that showed their love, he their first task imposed. That in a great field the tremendous crew must the next day before him in review. The Orient sun returned and issued out with more than usual glory, clear and bright, when with a new day's rays in armour stout, splendid beneath the banners, every knight came to good bouillon, rode or marched about the spacious meadow's rim in Godfrey's sight, who, standing firm, saw pass him by him his force, well-ordered battle groups of foot and horse. O oh, memory, time's foe, oblivion's shame, guardian and steward of all deeds of might, Lend me your force of mind, that I may name each leader and each company aright, resound and illustrate their ancient fame, already dulled by years and dimmed by night. Yield me your treasure, beautify my tongue, to keep them for all time forever young. First issued forth the Franks, once the command of Hugh. The brother of their king was he. In the Ile de France, a great and pleasant land, Amid four streams he chose this company. But ever since Hugh's death, the stalwart bond followed the reverend golden fleur-de-lis, under Clotha, great chief who lacked no thing except, if this be lack, the name of king. A thousand are they, armed in mail and plate. After them rides an equal troop of horse, much like the first in discipline and state, in outward looks and in well-armoured force, all Normans, Robert, crown prince designate of their dominions, steers their course. Next, two anointed shepherds guide, not far behind, their hosts, William and Adamar. Both one and the other, who in pious tasks once laboured with divine and reverent sway, their long locks gathered up beneath their casks, rehearse now war's harsh uses and array. The first from Orange and its region asks four hundred knights, they follow in his way. The other leads to battle from Le Puy, an equal number, no less warlike he. Next, Baldwin brings to view those of Bouillon, both his and Godfrey's, since his brother, who his captainship of captains has begun, now cedes to him his former retinue. The Count of the Connutians follows, one with mind strong to persuade, hands to subdue. Four hundred ride with him three times as large the well-nailed cavalry in Baldwin's charge. Next in the master, Guelph deploys in state his merit high as is his lineage good. His father's Latin house of ancient date is Esti. German is his mother's blood, his name and fiefs engrafted to the great Guelph dynasty. He rules where Ister's flood and Rhine's Corinthians ample lands unfold that Swabians and Rations held of old. To this realm, his by his mother's testament, he added conquests glorious and grand. Thence he brings troops who think it merriment to march into their doom at his command. Winters in their well-heated homes they spent were sailing with glad guests throughout their land. Five thousand were they when he led them out. Now scarce a third survive the Persian rout. Fair-skinned and blond of those who go next in line, bordering France and Germany and the sea, their land where flows the Meus, where flows the Rhine, with corn and cattle teams for husbandry. 
There are islanders, too, whose high-piled dikes can find their homes amid oceans of veracity, ocean that takes not merely ships in tow, but swallows cities and dominions whole. These and the former make a thousand who, under another Robert, march as one. Somewhat more numerous is the British crew, whom William leads, their monarch's younger son. These English are all archers. With them, too, a race that dwells nearer the pole. From dun forests they come, hair shaggy and uncurled, of Ireland, farthest outpost of the world. Tancred comes next. No better swordsman came thither except Rinaldo, and there's none more handsome or more kind, or who might claim a nobler heart or braver than his own. And if one shade of guilt beclouds his fame, it is the foolishness of love alone. A war-born love sprung from a fleeting sight that, fed with woe, is gathering force and might. Fame has it that the day the Franks uprose throughout the Persians, day of glorious name, when Tancred, after its victorious close, weary of chasing those he overcame, grew ready to refresh and to repose his burning lips and his much-laboured frame, he found where beckoned from a summery dwell, girdled with verdant turf, a living well. There, all at once, appeared to him a maid, clad in full armour, all except her face. Pagan she was. She too had sought the shade to find, like him, refreshment in that place. He saw her. He admired. He surveyed her fair semblance. He burned for it apace. Oh, marvellous! Love, scarcely born, takes wing at once full grown in arms and triumphing. She darned her helmet and prepared to fight, except that others rode up presently. The noble lady left her vanquished knight by mere necessity constrained to flee, but he kept fresh the warrior virgin's sight in his heart's core. There all that lives is she. She in that meeting place forever claim his mind and fuel a perpetual flame. And all who understand such things can con one message in his face. This man's on fire, a hopeless case. Sighing he walks and wan, with eyes downcast and sad, loves new one squire. Eight hundred mounted knights he leads, who on Campania's pleasant seashore call him sire. Those lovely hills, great nature's proudest boast, wooed by the waves, Tyrrhenia's fertile coast. Two hundred ride behind them, Grecian-born, each armed so lightly that it seems he lacks all steel, with scimitars athwart their sashes worn, and bows and quivers rattling on their backs. Their wiry steeds, well fed on little corn, are tireless in lock treks and swift attacks. Quick to maraud and quick to quit the fight, roving and scattered, they wage war by flight. Tatinus rules that band, the only Greek who joined the Latin armies. Oh, the shame, the crime! These wars, were they too far to seek, right at your doorstep, Greece? And yet you came to lounge a lazy spectac spectator and weak, who waits to see the outcome of the game. If you are now a slave, your slavery is, don't complain, justice, not infamy. Lo, now a band appears, the last in view, but first in honour, courage, skill in wars. These the adventurers, invincible crew, terror of Asia, thunderbolts of Mars. Hush, Argo's minions, Arthur's retinue of knights. Hush, paper dreams of errant stars. Here are the ones next whom all ancient fame fades. Say, what duke deserves to lead the same? Duden of Cons, that duke. For in that band of valour or birth were moot to choose between, the rest had placed themselves at his command, whom more than all had done and more had seen. Grave in his manly ripeness see him stand, white hair he shows, and yet his force is green. Deep scars he shows as well, that tell the story in butcher's wounds of all his martial glory. There's Eustace next in front, of much renown himself, of Maurice Bouillon's brother, the Germont rides next, scion of Norway's crown, vaunting the sceptred realm to which his heir. Roger of Balmerville, old fame marks down as there, and Engelen, 
and that double pair whose valour shines supreme in all regards. One Rimbaud, one Gentonio, two Gerards. Among these champions there are Hubbald and Rosmond, the ducal heir of Lancaster. Tuscan Rizzo's name let not time's hand drag down and make his memory a blur, nor blot out the three Lombard brothers, Grand Achilles, Sforza, Palamede, nor the stir made by great Otto, who by force did take that shield where a nude boy escapes a snake, nor Gascon the first, nor Rudolf leave behind, nor one nor the other Guido past compare, nor Everard nor Garnier leave consigned to dark oblivion's ever-fading air. But you, to what heights will you lift my mind, O Edward and Gildipe, wedded pair and lovers? Even in war you breathe one breath, nothing will sunder you, not even death. The schools of love, what can they not impart? In them she made herself a warrior wife, always beside him, ever next his heart. From one sole fate depends their either life. No blow can fall that gives a single smart, but both feel one pain at either's hurts and strife, and often hurt is she, while he deplores and pours his soul forth as her life-blood pours. But above these see young Rinaldo, mid the whole parade the champion absolute, sweetly ferocious, darting looks that bid a king's worship. Him all eyes here salute. Age he ran and hope, and scarcely did his flowers bud when he grew ripe with fruit. You'd think, when cased in glistening carapace, his Mars, his Cupid, when he bears his face. By Adige's fair river was he born, Sophia's progeny by Bertolt, fair Sophia, valiant Bertolt, and was torn, scarce weaned, in boyhood, at Matilda's prayer from his mother's breast. In all arts that adorn a prince Matilda nurtured him, and there he stayed till his young ardour stirred, released by the great trumpet calling from the east. Then did he fly, who scarce three lustre bore, alone to travel unknown roads. And he crossed the Aegean, passed the Grecian shore, then joined the distant camp across the sea. Noblest of flights, a worthy precedent for deeds that await his great-souled progeny. Three years has been at war, with a soft down that sprouts upon his chin not yell full grown. Now all the horsemen having passed are seen the foot soldiers, and Raymond leads them on. To lose he ruled, and chose his force between the Pyrenees and the seashores of Garonne. Well armed, well trained, inured to stress and keen for more, four thousand form that echelon. Good troops these are, nor could they have relied upon a wiser or a braver guide. Five thousand more Stephen of Amboise brings from Blois and Tours, but these are not a strong or hardy folk, though all their armour rings with steel and glitters as they march along. Mild is their land, gay, full of cheerful things. Mild, cheerful, gay are those who there belong. Their battle at first charge is brave and stout, but quickly languishes and fizzles out. Third comes Alcestis, haughty as of old at Thebes Capanais, menace in his face. From Alpine fortresses he has unrolled six thousand Swiss, a fierce and desperate race, who forged the steel they used to plough the mould into new shapes, to wield in work less base. With herdsmen's hands, once used for driving cattle, they care not now if kings should offer battle. Next sea unfurled the holy banner fly, blazing the crown of Peter and his keys. The good Camillus leads that company, seven thousand strong in shining cuirasses. Happy is he to be destined on high, to wake his forebears' fame, or show, God please, that valour lodged in an Italian skin lacks nothing, at least nothing but discipline. But now all regiments in splendid trim have passed in order, this one with the rest, when Godfrey calls the greater dukes to him, and what his mind conceives makes manifest. Soon, as the new sun gilds the eastern rim, the host must leave, and swiftly. Haste is best, for as it toward the holy city hies, the less delay, the greater the surprise. Therefore prepare to march at once, 
and plan on present battle, plan on victory too. These words of fire from so wise a man cheer and inspirit the entire crew. Eager to go, the eastern gate they scan and wait impatient for the morning dew. But prudent Bouillon meditates apart. One fear is his, though hidden in his heart. For he's had certain news that Egypt's king toward Gaza was already making way, the mighty fort whose walls loom threatening the Syrian realm. That prince, long bent on prey, was not a man by Godfrey's reckoning to tame his hate now or the sluggard play. He'd prove a bitter foe. The duke therefore calls faithfully faithful Henry his ambassador. Go board a light-sailed pinnace, set your course for the Greek shore, for there soon will be found, I have this information from a source not often wrong, a royal youth renowned for peerless courage and resistless force. To be in war our comrade he is bound, a prince of Denmark, he commands a whole battalion from the lands beneath the pole. But since the treacherous emperor of the Greeks might, with his wonted cunning, turn him back or wrest his bold course from the goal he seeks, away from us onto some far-off track, let you, my trusted envoy, in whom speaks my very self, urge him not to grow slack, for both our goods, but to join us straight away and not to stain his honour by delay. Yet rather than return with him, do you stay with the Greek king, claim the aid that more than once he promised us, now overdue, though guaranteed by treaty long before. So speaks he, counselling his envoy, who, furnished with letters and credentials for his weighty mission, takes an instant leave, and Godfrey gives his fears a brief reprieve. Next day, soon as the Orient Gateway flings in splendour open to let forth the sun, the noise of drumbeats joined the, with trumpets rings the summons to the march for everyone, a thunderclap in summer's heat, which brings the hope of rain, less welcome falls upon the ear than fell upon these fierce men's sense that haughty sound of warlike instruments. At once each man, seized by stupendous zeal, flings on his well-worn armour and his gear, and seems at once at all points sheathed in steel. At once each finds his captain, each his peer. Soon above serried ranks of soldiers reel the countless pennants, wind-tossed, fluttering clear, while the imperial flag billows on high, its cross laid bare, triumphant to the sky. Meanwhile the sun, annexing more and more of heaven's regions as he rises higher, strikes shields and helms with light and makes them pour showers of blinding gleams that flit and gyre. The whole air shimmers where these sparkles soar and shines as though infused with leaping fire. A mingled roar, steeds winning in their pride, steel clattering, deafens the countryside. The captain, wisely careful to protect his force against an ambush by the foe, deploys crowds of light horsemen to inspect and scour the region where his band must go, dispatches pioneers who can direct and smooth the road ahead of them, who know how to fill pits, level obstructing rocks, and clear whatever pathways fortune blocks. No infidel rats bandits together, no rampards engirt by ditches wide and deep, no streams in space, no Alps, no woods can throw them off the fated course they mean to keep. So sometimes, when the king of rivers, Poe, swells past all measure proud, he'll sweep across his banks upon his ruinous way, nothing whatever dares to bid him stay. Tripoli's king alone, whose citadel stands, its people, wealth and arms and strong walls pent, might haply have delayed the hosts of France, but dared not risk a war. In the event, he willingly received them in his lands, sent messengers with rich gifts to present such terms of peace as seemed, in every measure, imposed by pious Godfrey at his pleasure. Here from Mount Seir, whose peak right royal soars nearby, east of the city, a great crowd of faithful pell-mell downward paws of every age and either sex, they bowed gift-laden to the Christian conquerors, eager to see and speak with them, 
and loud with wonder at the foreign arms, and they, friendly and faithful, guided Godfrey's way. Ever in earshot of the sea waves roar, by the directest route he led the host, knowing full well that never far off shore the friendly navy sailed along the coast, which furnished to that host an ample store of food and gear, so that it seemed almost for them alone all Greek isles reaped their wheat, and rocky heels sent its wines and Crete. The nearby sea labours beneath the weight of high-decked galleys and a flight of scows, no path to Saracen craft, however straight this great Mediterranean force allows, St. Mark's Armada and St. George's fleet, Venice and Genoa, mass with allied prows, some England sends, some France and Holland some, others from Sicily the fertile come, and all of them, bound by the strongest ties of zeal and love, move with a single will, laden at various harbours with supplies for the land forces that, advancing still, reach the frontier at which no enemy lies in wait, its every pass unguarded, till they, pressing on with wondrous swiftness, gain the region where Christ suffered mortal pain. But fame, racing ahead of them, who carries both truthful tidings and deceitful tales, cries, The all-conquering host has met, nor tarries, but marches now, cries, All resistance fails. She names the squads, she numbers them, and varies her roster of the greatest names with tales of what they've sworn, and in her words of gloom Zion's usurpers glimpse the face of doom. An evil looming in the future may seem a worse evil than an evil now. Each ear and mind, suspended in dismay, feels the uncertain breath of rumour blow. Both in the doleful town and far away, in roads and fields, confused the whisperings grow. But the old king, by gathering perils pressed, revolves fierce counsels in his doubtful breast. Aladdin is his name. Newly made king of this domain, he lives in constant care, a cruel man once, though now ripe years bring some mitigation to his violent heir. Told that the Latins now are threatening to assail his city walls, he tears his hair as new doubts feed old fears within his head, his foes and subjects both alike his dread. For in a single city sacrificed a mingled people for opposing creeds, the weak and lesser part believes in Christ, the strong and greater part Muhammad heeds. But Zion's recent conquest had enticed the king to prop his throne by unjust deeds. He spared his pagans what they paid before, and taxed the wretched Christians all the more. In a fretful mood recalling this now, he shakes off the frigid torpor of his age, stunk back to his innate brutality, which, starved for blood, erupts the more with rage. So will an asp grow fierce in summer, free of the cold languor of its dormant stage. So a tame lion will at once revert to native fury at the slightest hurt. I've seen, said he, some telling signs of joy among this mob of infidels of late. The general ruin seems their hope's soul's toy. They laugh while others wail the tottering state. Perhaps even now they are planning to destroy my life by force or fraud, or in their hate are hatching plots how secretly to throw open the gates unto their kind, my foe. But they shall not. I'll spoil their treacherous game, and shake their stifling weight quite off my chest. I'll kill them all. I'll make their doom their fame. Slit baby throats, even at their mother's breast. Burn all their homes, their churches. By that flame their duty to their dead shall be expressed. But first, the very tomb on which they pray shall be turned altar where their priests shall slay. Thus in his heart reasons the wicked man, yet hesitates, though not for qualms, to act. For where he pardons, nothing better than cowardice moves him, not pity, not fact of innocence. The fears that made him plan atrocities are by worse fears attacked, of shutting off from compromises path or of too far provoking enemy wrath. His mad rage thus the villain must control, or rather elsewhere seek to give it vent. 
he wrecks and levels farms makes ash and coal of tilled lands forfeit to the ravishment of flame leaves not an acre sound or hole where frank might graze his horse or pitch his tent sullies the springs and rivers and depraves with deadly poisons all their innocent waves cautious as well as cruel he is not neglectful of jerusalem's defence three sides are screened by wondrous strong walls but the northern fourth of the circumference he at the first faint rumours spot by spot strengthens with ramparts solid and immense and there a huge troop he in haste and places of mercenaries and of subject races Kalinith.